Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We've been talking about the Church of Jesus Christ. We've been looking at what does the Bible teach about the Church of Jesus Christ. The Church is God's community on this earth. People who have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ and who are therefore in relationship with Him and in relationship with one another. We've seen how the Church of Jesus Christ is the principal way in which God is going to bring glory to His name on this earth. And right now in the teaching, we're looking at leadership in the church. We've seen that the local church leadership is made up of elders and deacons. Elders who've been given the responsibility for the spiritual government and guidance and direction of the church. And we've also seen that deacons have a servant role to ensure that eldership is free from many of the practical responsibilities that would detract them from their spiritual leadership. And now we're going to move on and talk about the ministry gifts of Christ. These are found in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers. Jesus was all of these things rolled into one. He's the great apostle, the great prophet, the great evangelist, the great pastor, the great teacher. But he has gifted certain people within the church, not everybody, but some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And their role is to teach the rest of us and to train the rest of us so that we can be raised up to do the work of Jesus Christ. And so now we're going to begin with the teaching on the Apostle. What is an Apostle and how can we understand this ministry today? Now let me say, use this as an example in the, this uh, series. I already mentioned to you that Jesus only uses the word church twice in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. And yet the Apostle Paul uses the word church many, many times. Peter describes these things. Many of the things that the Apostles taught, Jesus didn't mention because he committed into their hands this apostolic revelation. And so with the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, we have the New Testament revelation, which is the foundational revelation of God. And now the New Testament is completed. We don't need any more apostles to come and tell us what Jesus did, what Jesus said. We have that as a record. We don't need any more to have somebody to come and tell us infallibly from Jesus that this is his ruling on this matter, this is his ruling on that matter. We don't have... We don't need that because we have what the apostles left us, which is the scriptures. And so the infallible record of apostolic teaching and apostolic doctrine and apostolic re revelation is found for us in the scriptures. And so now we don't need any more of those foundation apostles, those first century apostles. We have the scriptures, we have the full record of their ministry. But we do need the general apostles. Those who were, even in the time of the foundation apostles, were ministering and were doing things which were very similar to the foundation apostles, but didn't minister at the same level. So we have some uh, New Testament examples of general apostles. One of them is Barnabas. He was not one of the twelve. He was in a separate category, and yet Paul and Barnabas are called apostles. Paul was a, an apostle who was called by revelation of Jesus Christ. He never saw Jesus in the flesh in that way. He wasn't called by Jesus in that way. But he was called by Jesus by a revelation on the Damascus Road. And that's why he said, I was, I'm the last of them. I'm, I'm the one abnormally born. But at the same time, he fits into that category. He says, have I not seen Jesus? Am I not also one of the apostles? He is one of the foundation apostles. In fact, he is used by Jesus to write more of the New Testament than any other apostle. Two-thirds of the New Testament come from the apostle Paul. So clearly he's a foundational apostle. But Barnabas, his companion, also an apostle, wasn't a foundational apostle. He wasn't called with that same authority to, to give the revelation of God's gospel to the world like Paul was. But he was, he was definitely an apostle. He had an apostolic function. And there are many others. You can see them in the, script, in the scripture references I give you. Andronicus and Junius. These were apostles. And Junius was probably a woman. 
Uh, now, some scholars d debate that, depends on how you read her name, but it just goes to show you that those who exclude women from levels of leadership in the church and think that's a New Testament pattern need to do a little bit more study. Now, Ephesians 4.11 suggests to us that these giftings, apostles, prophets, and so forth, are given to the church for the continual building and equipping of the saints in every age and in every place until Christ returns. So there must therefore be an ongoing ministry of apostleship. One level, the foundational level, is completed. We don't have any more apostles like that. If anybody comes claiming that they say, I have got an infallible word from the Lord, this is what Jesus is saying, and you must do it, and to reject my word is to reject Jesus, know they are a false apostle. There is no such thing as the Holy Spirit speaking infallibly through apostolic ministries today. We know, however, that a level of apostleship does exist. We don't need the infallibility and that level of authority because our infallibility and our authority is the Scriptures. We judge everything by the Scriptures, not by what some apostle says. And that's where cults arise. When some so-called apostle says, well, that's what the Scriptures say, but this is what I say. No, we judge you by what the Scriptures say. You can't assert yourself over scriptural authority. You must submit to scriptural authority. Your authority is lesser than the scriptural authority. So apostles are necessary for the building of the body of Christ and the building of the, and equipping of the saints in every age. And when we see the apostolic role, when we see what the apostles did in the New Testament, apart from that level of inspiration and foundational thing that I was talking about, we will also see how we need them today. Apostles have a ministry of fatherhood. Fatherhood. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, Paul says, though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. So fatherhood speaks of a life-giving function. If you father something, you bring it to life. You give it life. You generate it. We need people who are life-giving fathers in the church of Jesus Christ today to build up and inspire God's people, to nurture and protect them. And it's the same as in Paul's day. There are many instructors, those people who will lord it over, many people asserting authority, but few true apostolic fathers. With this position comes an authority. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 8, For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification, and not for destruction, I shall not be ashamed. So he says, I have been given authority, but to build you up, not to destroy you. There is a level of apostolic authority that we need. Apostles have authority in the Spirit to speak God's vision and to implement God's vision with authority. Apostolic ministry also is a ministry of signs and wonders. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance. Now the signs of an apostle are more than signs and wonders. Signs of an apostle were persecution, holding to Christ, servanthood, willingness to suffer, many of these things we find in 2 Corinthians. But here he lists one of the signs. In signs and wonders and mighty deeds, that's the mark of an apostle, one of the marks of an apostle, that the apostle will minister in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Another function of the apostle is to raise leaders and release giftings. Everywhere Paul went, he raised leaders like Timothy, and instructed them. And so, an apostolic function is to raise leaders within the body of Christ and release them into the work of the body. Also, leaders, uh, apostolic leaders are called to structure and to strengthen church life. So they are called to establish church structures so that those structures would enable the church to be strong. We also see, finally, that apostles had a precise calling they were called to a precise area. Sometimes that was geographical, and sometimes they were sent to people groups. Paul says, my apostleship is for the Gentiles, and acknowledge that Peter's apostleship is for the Jews. So Paul's primary apostolic ministry was exercised amongst the Gentiles. 
and Paul was not willing to lay on somebody else's foundation. He wanted to go on and build new foundations and to go into the new regions where God was sending him. And so we must be careful to understand that apostolic ministry will be expressed in certain respects. I believe there are apostolic ministers today in various doctrinal areas. Apostolic leaders, apostolic ministers of faith, apostolic ministers of healing, certain areas of the ministry of Christ, especially as these ministries need to be restored to the body of Christ. So the apostolic ministry is vital, a vital function for the body of Christ today. Now, prophets. Prophets. The Greek word for prophet is prophetes, which comes from pro, meaning forth, and femi, meaning to speak. Prophets, prophetes, are those who speak forth. It literally means one who speaks forth, and it describes somebody that is speaking God's words and revealing God's thoughts. Now, obviously, to do this, you need to be in close relationship with God. You need to be in close communion with God to be hearing what God's saying. Ideally, prophets only pass on what he is saying and don't taint the message with their own opinions. Now, in the New Testament, there again seems to be two types of prophets. Those who functioned only within a local church. Congregational prophets. Congregational prophets. Then there also seem to be those who were more widely recognized and who functioned translocally. And these are the ones that I'm focusing on now. For example, Acts chapter 11, verse 27 and 28. It said, in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the whole world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So, here we have certain prophets. They were called prophets. They were acknowledged as prophets. They weren't just those who prophesied, but these were called prophets. They had a ministry of prophecy. They prophesied regularly. They were prophets officially recognized as prophets, that this was their ministry. They also had a translocal ministry because they came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and they prophesied there. And these are the prophets, I believe, that we're speaking of here in Ephesians 4, verse 11. Now, I want to show you how this worked in the New Testament. Now, obviously, we don't have time to go into great detail. In fact, just for the record, I have a whole teaching series on the ministry gift of Christ, and uh, it's not at this stage part of the Sword of the Spirit series, but I'm just saying it to help you understand that I'm going to have to hurry through this material, and there's so much more that can be said and needs to be said. Please make sure you go to the manual thoroughly and read every detail of what I've recorded there for you. But let's look at seven aspects of prophetic ministry in the New Testament very quickly. Number one, it was officially recognized. So this just weren't people who prophesied informally. They were those who were acknowledged and recognized as the ministry of, of having a ministry of a prophet. Now, in many parts of the Church of Jesus Christ, you can only call yourself a pastor. If you call yourself a prophet, you're in big trouble. If you call yourself an apostle, you really have to be dead in order to do that. And if you do, you, they may even kill you for it. But, but it's only when you're dead and long gone, safely buried, that they can say, oh, there was a mighty apostle. There was a mighty prophet. But in the early church, in the New Testament, this ministry was recognized. Secondly, we see that this ministry carried revelation, factual revelation. We've just read about it there in the book of Acts. How Agapus said, we... There is coming something. It was a factual revelation. A famine was coming. They spoke by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We also need to see that they were not infallible. They were not infallible. Even Agabus's prophecy in Acts chapter 21. I'd like you to turn to it just to have, to have a look. In Acts chapter 21, Agabus' prophecy there is not, uh, well, we can pick holes in it if we wanted to be pedantic. Here we have Acts chapter 21, verse 11, 10 and 11. As we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Abacus came down from Judea. There he is again, translocal prophet. When he'd come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. It was a clear prophecy 
that Paul was going to be put under arrest in, the, in Jerusalem. And a clear prophecy that the Jews would instigate it. But when you read the fulfillment of that prophecy, it was not the Jews who physically bound him, it was the Gentiles who did it. So you may say, well, you're being very pedantic and saying, well, this prophecy was fulfilled. Yes, it was fulfilled in detail, but if you wanted to say, in, it was every word fulfilled exactly as Abacus, Ab, Abacus, why am I struggling with his name, Agabus, why this fellow Agabus' prophecy, if you say, was this every word fulfilled in every detail? No, not if you want to be pedantic. Now, this shows us that uh, we are not necessarily to attach absolute supreme importance and significance to every word a prophet says. And if you do that, you're going to be in trouble. Even actually reading on in this uh, passage, verse 12, it says, Now when we heard these things, both we and those from the place pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul said, What do you mean weeping and breaking my heart? I am not only ready to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul acknowledged that it was a word from the Lord, but he, he didn't let him, didn't put him off. And in another place, they actually told him by the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. Well, they were overstepping their mark. And so what this seems to me to be here is a pattern of prophecy amongst prophets in the New Testament and today that their words must be judged and weighed. You cannot simply accept every word a prophet says because they are a prophet. Now you have to accept every word that the Bible says because the Bible is the word of God. And you'd have to accept every word that the apostles spoke when they were speaking by inspiration of the Spirit. And that's what the apostle Paul says. We must learn to judge and to discern and to test what happens and what is said. Number five, we see that prophets predicted the future. There is a predictive element. Number six, we also see they gave direction for ministry. For although they confirmed much what is already known, they still gave direction. Acts chapter 13 makes it very clear as they were ministering together and fasting to the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me. Saul and Barnabas for the work to which I have called them to. Separate Saul and Barnabas to the work which I have already called them to. That's most likely a prophetic word from one of the prophets that I just mentioned in the previous verse. So that's a word of direction. They gave direction. Number seven, they pointed to what God was doing. By giving direction, they didn't take control. They simply pointed to what God was doing, and that was their direction. In Acts 11, when Agabus prophesies about the famine, it was the leaders who got together, and the disciples said, what are we going to do about this? So Agabus pointed to what God was saying, what God was doing. He didn't then direct them uh, from in a kind of controlling, directive way. And that's why we must be very careful before we allow prophets, as prophets, to lead the church. Prophets as prophets must bring direction and speak the word of the Lord, but the responsibility for implementing that and for following that lies with the leaders, not with the prophets, lies with the leaders corporately. Wherever you have people functioning as prophets and leading as prophets and running the church as prophets, you are in big trouble. It becomes unbalanced. We need all the ministries to help govern the church and to guard the church and to lead the church. Well, those are all I can say right now about prophets. Now let's move quickly into the rest of these ministries. Evangelists. The Greek word for evangelist is euangelistes, evangelist. It comes from you, meaning well, and angelos, meaning messenger. So it's the messenger of the good news, one who brings good news. Euangelizio, euangelizo, the verb means to announce good news. And it's a very common word in the New Testament. But the noun, euangelistes, appears only three times. So the word evangelist appears only three times. Once in Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Once in the book of Acts, Philip the evangelist. And here in the book of Ephesians, the office or the function of the evangelist. 
Now, all Christians are called to be evangelists, aren't we? We're all called to announce good news. But there are some who are given a very special task of evangelism, a very special role of evangelism. And when you see an evangelist work, an evangelist can stand up and just give the notices and then make an appeal and dozens come to Christ. Whereas a pastor or a Bible teacher could Bible teach and pastor and preach the gospel and only see a handful. There's a special gifting for evangelists to bring people to Christ. It's a glorious gifting. It's a wonderful gifting. And we need evangelists. And I'm praying that many of you will respond to an evangelistic call upon your life. For there are evangelists who are here today, and there are apostles, and there are Bible teachers, and there are prophets and pastors as well. There are the fivefold ministries here, in embryo form, in embryonic form. God wants you to rise up in your Ephesians 4.11 ministry, and you won't, it won't happen overnight. You need to submit yourself to your church leadership, to be trained, to wait upon God in your ministry. And so, we find then that this ministry of an evangelist is powerful. Have a look in Acts chapter 8 for yourself and see what happens when the evangelist comes to town. Glorious outbreaking of God's kingdom. Now moving on to pastors. The Greek word here is poimen, literally means a shepherd, and it describes somebody who cares for animals, who feeds them. It's used metaphorically of pastors to tend to the flock of God. Again, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he continues his shepherdly ministry through his under-shepherds, through pastors who care for the flock of God. A wonderful ministry. The Lord has a powerful shepherdly ministry. The Lord is our shepherd, and he raises up, raises up shepherds who will lead us and guide us. What is the work of pastoring? And let me speak to the pastor on the inside of you. I'm praying as I'm preaching this that God will raise up these leaders and raise up pastors from amongst us This is the work of pastoring. Those who know how to gather the flock, not scatter the flock, gather the flock, gather the flock. Some people say, well, I've got a great ministry. I have got a Gideon ministry. I scatter the flock, and out of thousands, I whittle them down to 300. Well, some people might take 300 and whittle them down to three and say, glory to God, we've only got the refined, pure people there. And wherever I'm going nowadays, I'm hearing, oh, God's given me a Gideon ministry. No, he has not given you a Gideon ministry. Get on on with your ministry. You're supposed to gather the flock, not scatter the flock. You're supposed to grow the church, not shrink the church. The shepherds are gatherers. They're also those who guard the flock of God. Keep watch over God's flock with your lives if you're a shepherd. Guiding the flock, leading the sheep from out front to good pastures, grazing the flock, making sure that the sheep are well fed praying for the flock of God, staying alert and keeping on praying for all the saints, listening to the, to the sheep, listening to the sheep. You have to be a good listener. Shepherds could tell the sheep by looking at them who they were. Oh, there's Flossie bleating away. You've got to listen to the sheep. I heard one pastor say, don't listen to the sheep. Sheep are silly. And sheep are silly, aren't they? The physical animals... God's people aren't silly. God's people are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. Don't you call God's people silly. You, when you lead them, you don't lead them as if they're a bunch of silly sheep. You lead them as God's precious heritage. And they've been entrusted by Jesus into your precious hands. And when you minister as a shepherd, you're ministering like Jesus. Bring admonition to the flock. They correct and admonish. They care for the flock of God. They heal the flock of God. They counsel the flock of God. They support the flock of God. Look at these details carefully and let God bring to you the ministry he's given you. Now finally, and very briefly, the ministry of teachers. Didaskolos, teacher. The one who gives instruction, who instructs, who teaches the scriptures, The scriptures teach us. The scriptures rebuke us. The scriptures correct us. The scriptures train us. That's what it says in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17. And so teachers are going to teach you. They're going to instruct you. They're going to rebuke you. They're going to correct you. And they're going to train you. Amen? That's what you've come for. 
you know, you've come for a teaching ministry, and that's what I'm doing through this series. I'm teaching you, and you're going to be shaped and helped. So interesting, where Saul and Barnabas came to Antioch, and they taught the people there, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The teaching ministry makes you like Christ, so other people will see Jesus in you. And so these pastors and teachers minister together in the local body. They're closely associated together, pastors and teachers. But there are those pastors and teachers who will also have a translocal function. So we see that all these ministries together are called to build the body of Christ, to equip the body of Christ. It's Jesus' ministry to the body through these whom he has gifted with aspects of his own great and glorious ministry. And so we must make sure that each of these ministries are functioning within the body of Christ. The local ministries, elders and deacons. The translocal ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And God help you and guide you in your own leadership aspirations, that you will discover what the gift is in you and that you will grow to be God's apostle, God's prophet, God's pastor, God's evangelist, God's teacher, the elder, the deacon, wherever God has placed you to be. Humble yourself, train, discipline yourself, develop, the, develop those character qualities that you read about in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and God will bring you to the level of leadership he's ordained for you. God bless you. That's the end of this teaching today on leadership in the church. And we'll be back next session to take you further into glory in the church. God bless you.